Well, good morning, and it's uh, always great to be back in Canada. I'm no stranger to this country, and many of you are my friends. Although in my new role, I'm probably a stranger to you as the president of the IOM or the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, first of all, congratulations, 10 years. I've known Paul Armstrong for more than 10 years, certainly quite a few years, as a fellow cardiologist, and I have great respect for him. And uh, the vision that he has for this academy is truly uh, very impressive. And of course, all of you who are members of this academy. Um, you know, so as I think about what I'll talk about today, and particularly last night, as I was talking to John Keynes about uh, what exactly uh, would you like me to speak about, I thought maybe best is for you to, for me to share with you uh, my experience. After all, I'm on this new journey for this past year. I've been a member for a long time, but, and on council and executive committee, but it's actually quite interesting to be an insider and say, what are the issues that we think about in the academy? How do we actually move uh, our agenda forward? And I would say, first of all, uh, it's a challenge every day because getting the recognition, as you heard so clearly from Paul and from Graham, and getting the actually um, the response, if you will, uh, of the many thoughts you have, reports, etc., is a challenge. And so, among the things I'm doing is to really think about a dissemination strategy. That is to say, aside from, pr from prioritization, which is what Paul has greatly articulated, these are the kind of things we need to do. The question is, you have a report. What happens to it? And, and before I took the job as president, um, I heard from many people, and since I took the job, I went on listening tour around the country. You know, we visited something like eight to 10 cities, meeting with members, with public, with healthcare providers, and with the private sector, particularly industry and philanthropists. And one of the question frequently is, you do a lot of report, what happens to it? They sit on the shelf, does anything happen? So among the things that I believe that you become a successful academy is a clear idea of how you're going to put forward your reports and make a strategy before you even start your report to say who are the ones that need to listen to this message and how are we going to move this message forward. So with that background, let me begin by saying that, um, you know, as Paul has uh, articulated so well, we face with many opportunities, and that's what academies should be here doing. Every university sees these opportunities, but they're individual entity, but together as a body of learner society, being able to come together and address these issues and provide advice to the government and public is critically important. Now, in these days of partisan politics and public mistrust of government decisions, information overload, I think a need for an academy that can provide decision makers, policy makers, and the public with the best available evidence, I think there's never been more pressing. The benefits of an independent, as uh, Graham Bell pointed out, and a scientific-based academy are enormous for society. And that's the case we need to make to everybody, to policymakers. Now, one of the things that's been really, we've been blessed in many ways in US uh, because we're founded by the government as an independent body to advise them, which is somewhat different, as you heard, from the history of many other academies. And that's put us in great advantage from day one. But I want to point out to you, I only put this quote up there because the public perceived us to be of value. Also, we, I can put you many quotes from governments uh, because we had to go through this transition to a national academy from IOM. You know, what is our brand, we call. You should ask yourself, in today's terms, what's your brand? And if you look at one of the quotes we put there, the New York Times described, and I quote, the most esteemed authoritative, Graham's word, advisor on issues of health medicine report can transform medical things around the world. When you can achieve that status, and we actually have a great news and public press media, and we track every day what happens to our report and how is it being received. 
Now, so you're driving the changes from another direction. Aside from saying, government, please read this report, there's the opportunity when you report are impactful that the public says, listen, we want something to be done about this because you take attention and these are scientifically evidence, independent, credible individuals that came together to, to ask what's best for the nation. So as uh, Graham Bell pointed out, um, we found you know, our roots back in 1863. The National Academy of Science, which is the parent organization, if you will, of the US National Academies, was chartered, congressionally chartered, signed into law by Abraham Lincoln and Congress. And that certainly was one great advantage. This is, to me, the visionary of our forefathers to say, during the Civil War, we need an academy so that we can call upon them by any department of the government to investigate, examine, and report upon any subjects of arts or science, but the academy shall receive no compensation whatsoever. So we do not have appropriation. Again, I want to reflect, I think, a very elegant talk that Graham Bell put forth. We are independent, but they found us to want that advice. Why? Well, you can imagine then and now, when governments are faced with partisan politics, mistrust of public, not knowing where to turn, your best position will be that the government says, let's turn to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Right? That simply means that public matters, and what you say matters, and when the government tells itself what to do in certain areas, you can imagine the issue of having independent validation. And that's what I think one should position such academy. So over the years of National Academy of Sciences, it's actually been critical in so many issues in, 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 in navigation and uh, the founding of you know, uh, many public um, goods, including, in fact, the early days of, uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, the response to Smutnik, et cetera. And also, importantly, of course, the Asilomar meeting on the recombinant DNA. Now, we were, uh, we're born out of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, 50 years ago, the engineers felt it was necessary to develop an academy, and so out came the National Academy of Engineering as a um, peer academy of sciences, but under the same roof. And then, of course, 45 years ago, yes, we're celebrating 45 years, the Institute of Medicine was born. At the time, there was a desire of independent bodies of, uh, of, uh, of uh, scholars and physicians to create a National Academy of Medicine. And in fact, the right thing to do then was become a health arm of National Academy of Sciences. And we've been that way, actually, until July 1, uh, 2015. But we've always been treated as a third academy. We have distinguished members, outstanding, some of the very best, and we have 45 Nobel laureates on our academy and many others. So um, as Graham pointed out, it's a, it represents a recognition, and as Paul did, of the scholars and scientific, the scientists and physicians that have moved the field forward within health and medicine. We elect 70 new members a year, 10 foreign associates, and certainly we have, very proud to have our share of Canadian appointments. By the way, we've changed our word to international members. I thought foreign associates low derogatory, being a foreigner myself most of my life. Um, and uh, importantly, by charter, a quarter of the members have to come outside the health field, but have relevance to what we do. And all told, we have about 2,000 members. Now, it's really important to point out, as been said earlier, there are two functions of academy. We take the programmatic function extremely important because they amplify each other. And in fact, you know, academy members volunteer their time to actually put forward these reports and programs. So as you can see, every year we engage over 3,000 experts, not always academy members, frequently members from anywhere. I have to say that the academy has reached a status 
It's not like the old EF Hutton, when we call, they all show up. And so we can get the very best people. Hence, the reports are extremely credible for that reason. We do about 80 projects a year. I would say 25 reports, what we call consensus report, which I'll come back to later. And we run about 40 different forums, uh, 20 different forums. Here's what we do best. When it comes to advice, we do two things really, really well. And that's, they, you know, that's really the quality of academy. And I would say that any academy that can reach a status where these two activities are of the highest quality and uh, independence and trust, now I use the trust word very importantly, then you are successful. First is convening. And secondly is writing high quality reports which are independent, scientifically based, and uh, and give recommendations to inform health and healthcare. I'd like to take a minute and tell you about our major activities. If you look on the left-hand side, they are listed as follows. First, the gold standard of any thing we put forward as a report for recommendation is called consensus study. And when we put forward our report, we put our name behind it. Now, this actually turns out to be highly guarded treasure at the National Academies with very extensive oversight. We have a governing board, we have review committees. I'll come back and talk about this. Because the reports are independent, they have to achieve a consensus. In other words, it can be opinions of scientists getting together. And it's too frequently have I attended meetings in other academies where it really is no more than a workshop when people come together and they agree with set recommendations, they put that forth. Consensus that take us a year to 18 months to do. It's, um, it's compliant with the Federal Advisory Commission Act. It has to have public hearing and also private meetings. All members have to reach consensus. And of course, you can have minority opinion. But until everybody signs off on this report, it doesn't go forward. But that doesn't quite end. They see the major product. It goes through a review process. We have a organization called the National Research Council in which Paul referred to earlier. And we have a governing board of the three academies with members and we have review committees. And each of these report undergo a review as long as with about 20, 30 reviews, and they have to be more than a journal. We have to get to the point where people say, okay, these recommendations are objective, independent, and we're in agreement, after which then we release the report, usually in the Capitol Hill. In fact, next week we're releasing a report on, you know, we're famous for medication errors. It's going to be on errors of diagnosis. Huge impact, I think, next phase of quality series. And then we do press release, and of course, I'll talk about follow-up in terms of impacts. We run forms and roundtables, and forms and roundtables are principally one of, um, let's see if I can point that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, forms and roundtables are ongoing convening of experts. And it's quite all right, in the consensus report, we can't have any conflict. In other words, we go through extensive conflict. Nobody can have any commercial financial conflict so that the reports are beyond reproach because I can just see it. You read this report, someone's going to say, well, you said this because you have financial interest in that. So in taking on this job I have, which is a full-time job for six-year term, uh, it's, I give up all my commercial activities. I divest all my commercial, any kind of commercial economic uh, interest in areas of health, uh, industry, et cetera. Now, the roundtables and uh, forums are ongoing convening of people from all different aspects. So you can imagine with FDA, industry, academia, people sitting around the same table, being able to discuss these issues with us as a neutral party. And frequently, they actually one of the most useful things for the government, because we hear from FDA, you know, we couldn't talk to these guys one-on-one, -on -one, but under this circumstance, it was really great that we can go back and think about how to change it. And they are sponsored and supported by multiple sponsors, including NIH, FDA, many others. 
Workshops are usually one time where there's a really topic which is timely. And we provide workshop summaries, but these are not reports with recommendation. We're very clear to point out it's a workshop summary with a series of opinions. Even though there may be general agreement, it hasn't gone through the extensive review as we did. And finally, we publish papers. Uh, actually, everybody knows about the proceeding of the National Academy of Science, but this perspective is an enablement of actually people coming from these meetings to publish their perspective. They're peer review, but they don't represent the Academy's position. I might have taken too much time to going through this, but I think it is important to say, how do you get trust? Why are your report trusted? I think rarely would we argue that people would argue that reports that come out from National University of Sciences, Engineering, or Medicine, uh, you know, have low quality. We are trusted because we have no political, commercial affiliations. We're very careful about our political uh, uh, positions. Uh, we have expertise, uh, they're evidence-based, and they define governance procedures that are show integrity and dependence. Now, I'm quite active now in working with other academies, particularly in the International Academy, or they call the, this one is the International um, Academy of Medical Panels, I think that's what it's called, or AIMP, which is now, again, a sister organizer of AIAP. And I think too many academies do not have this degree of rigor and hence are easily subject to, in fact, criticism of the report they put forward. Okay, um, how we organize? We have, uh, we call boards really are the sections. There are these nine sections which, like a university, have different departments with staff in there, with leaders whose job is to look at you know, with expertise in these areas, from global health, food and nutrition, to health sciences, policy, healthcare services, children, youth and family, uh, and others, which I'll talk a little bit about. And our work is mainly to inform, in fact, these areas based on the work that we do. I'm not gonna take too much time except to point out that over the years, uh, we have put out some really critically important reports, either by ourselves, or in collaboration with our sister academy, National Academy of Science. For example, stem cells. This report, chaired by Richard Hines, is probably one of the most authoritative reports in terms of what is the proper conduct of stem cells, particularly under different countries with different regulations how you can use stem cells. Or the area of omics, and most importantly, we had the sponsorship. Let's see if I can go backwards. Can I go backwards? Yeah. Oh, the there you go. Um, this one here, we had 23 different sponsors that included industry, NIH, academia, foundations to say how do we actually create a framework for sharing clinical data, data sharing, hot area. And now with the re recommendations of the need, for example, we say that within 18 months of completion of a trial, the data should be made public. There, in fact, is great momentum towards actually eventually making this policy for, this, for our country. Healthcare. You heard Bob Naylor mention last night about our quality series, which really, in many ways, transformed the way we do healthcare. We pointed out that up to 100,000 deaths a year are from medical errors. That was 15 years ago. What's changed? You go to a hospital with checklist, with, uh, you know, washing your hands, looking at all the hospital acquired conditions, etc. cetera. Uh, this quality chasm set the tone for this. And as I told you, we're just about to release the other side of the equation, which is what about diagnostic error? It's a huge problem. Cost and still quality. And we're now about to take on a big study called Quality in Low and Middle Income Countries. Because as you know, post-2015 UN agenda is universal health coverage. What is universal health coverage? It's about everybody having access to health care. That's usually a financial tool. It could be, in fact, you know, 
true access to doctors, et cetera, but the quality issue is never addressed. And you'll be amazed at some of the data that's come out in some of the studies. As much as 45% diagnostic errors in some under-resourced countries. So we want to shine a light to this. And I'll come back to how we make decisions about what we take on as topics. But, you know, uh, many issues like we coined the term learning health system, which obviously is now think about you heard big data, the ability to learn from your own experience using data analysis and evidence generation, etc. Finally, public health. Uh, lots of work on obesity and others, but also importantly, the drive towards integrating public health and primary care. There's a cry now across internationally, particularly since Ebola, the real need to integrate these uh, areas. And certainly we were among the first to point that out in our reports. And regulation. So we actually get asked by FDA and others to say, what do we do in this area? So as you can see, our regulation goes goes quite broadly in terms of what's safe and effective medication for children to, oops, um, international harmonization. I keep on doing the wrong thing. Anyway, right here. And others. So I think I should take a minute to tell you how we fund it because it is a central issue. We do not have appropriations as you saw in our charter, we do not get funding from the government. We should not be, quote, compensated. So how do we get funded? Well, because of our congressional charter, the government will come to us to ask if we would do a study for them and not help them make a policy. So we're no different than a university. We take them as project by project, funded on the projects with indirect recovery that supports the organization. But we get it from Congress. 50% of our work, and in fact my peer uh, academies, engineering and science, about 80% of the work actually are commissioned by the government. And there's a real difference because government comes to us to say, we want you to be that organization to give us advice. They know they get independent advice and sometimes they're not happy with our advice. For example, we did the one on women's health services. Well, the Republican Congress is quite unhappy about what we propose, but it was adopted because it's part of the Affordable Care Act. So there are many nuances within the government organization, in this case in health, and I'll talk a little bit about research and regulatory policy. They do come to us. Sometimes they don't listen to us, and most of the time they do. And so they'll come from Congress, they can come from the White House, they can come from uh, NIH, FDA, CDC, and many others. For us, that's 50% of our work. The other 50 comes from really hard work that my predecessor and now myself developed with foundations, expressing to them how important these issues are, and I'll come back to give you some examples of that, and philanthropists. Not a huge amount, but we do have example, as been mentioned by David last night, on end-of-life care by private philanthropy. So um, we, this is a very important function that we should all aspire because we all know that success in the long run will be people like you, however, with great interest and expertise in policy. So we have fellowship program, and of course, some of the best known programs, Robert Wood Johnson, clinical scholar, that's been going around for 20 some years. What happens is that, so this is another direction you could be thinking about that is to say that we have different types of fellowship. This one called anniversary fellowship, we have eight different fellowships funded and endowed by the American Board of Internal Medicine, American Board of Emergency Medicine, the Greenwall Foundation on Bioethical Fellowship so that people who are emerging as leaders in medicine can spend time in Washington and can spend time depending on which type. The Robert Wood Johns is a full year and sometimes two years, and others are part-time with a commitment to learn about policy. And they become, in fact, as you can imagine, our arms and extension into the political world who eventually may well become our members as well. 
Uh, finally, as I said earlier, in July 2015, after a um, extensive consultation, vote by membership, a reconstitution of the National Academies, uh, we now the National Academy of, Sci of Medicine. And in fact, point, as pointed out by um, Graham Bell, we now brand ourselves as the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine. Exactly the point, because we figure by three academies coming under one roof, we're stronger in sharing ideas and data. So in the programmatic side of IOM or NAM, we have just reconstituted, in fact, the committees necessary to include more engineers, more economists, more others, and our members are also serving on many of the other committees on physical engineering sciences, climate change, many others. And we believe we become stronger. And so you're going to see more and more a description of Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Because we're trying to retain our brand for many of the programs, a report from IOM. Although I think my guess would be in a year or so, that name may disappear. Of course, we are now really truly named as National Academy of Medicine. So we're going through some branding uh, challenges, which I live every day in trying to figure out, telling people what we are, who we are. But we're the same organization with a different name. Now, one of the things when I took this job was really thinking about what is, it's, it's really gone quite well for 45 years, not without these challenges, you know. And I'll, uh, parenthetically, those nine divisions or sections, that they're run by senior directors who are very well known and very experienced, like Mike McGinnis, who's written some of the seminal papers on, you know, social determinants of health. They spend their time running their section, think about what's important, and their outside advisory committees, people like yourself, that formulate the strategy, and they spend a lot of time raising money. Because once you've got a good idea, the question is, who's going to support this? So you have to develop to a critical mass, being able to be out there connected, and being able to raise the sponsorship and the interest, and of course, having innovation impact. What in fact is the impact? What is the dissemination strategy, et cetera? So what I'm doing now with the Academy is spending a lot of time trying to tweak, if not reform the Academy, pushing towards a little bit more aggressively, although I have to tell you, we have, you know, 152 years. We have lots of tradition. We have lots of policy. We don't do advocacy. So what is efficacy if you have a report to say we should change the way we manage people with end-of-life care? Do we stop talking about it after the report, or do we keep talking about this? So we're redefining those issues about what it is. And my feeling is if we do a true report with our name behind it with recommendation, taking it forward is not efficacy, but we don't implement. That is, we don't really go it's other for other people to implement. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So we have redone our tagline from advising the nation, improving health, because everybody knows that's what we do. And in fact, we advise a lot more than the nation. We advise globally to leadership, innovation, impact. And that we are very cognizant of the tools that we need to develop to be more impactful. That is, actionable recommendations. The ability to disseminate our information. With good ideas that come out of this, how do we incubate these ideas further so that they can be implemented outside our organization? Who are our partnerships? And how do we start new ideas called initiatives be before they become codified as long-term programs? So first, innovation. Part of the work I'm working on is to create a culture of innovation so that we think about new ways of doing things but more importantly, as I said, is how do ideas germinate and how do we take these ideas forward? And how, in fact, do we end up with um, a good set of recommendations or a good set of discussion at a round table? What happens next? So learning from the accelerator model in biomedical research, we are now creating accelerator. In other words, we do not found the companies, 
but we create an incubation space, after which the recommendation continues to have five, the five stoked, people come together and begin to spend time thinking about how to move this forward. We are a convener. We are a convener. So people can say, what's our strategy moving this forward? How do we in fact raise the money? How do we create an infrastructure? How do we in fact create an organizational structure? And how do we launch this? A good example, for example, is a new thing called PeaceNet. And I think Paul Armstrong would appreciate this because out of many conversation is realization for pediatric research, there's no network, you know. So how do you do clinical trials to move, to understand, you know, what works in the children population or not? So people came together and created a 501c3 peach net, which is now being the organization that collects data and it's almost like an ARO equivalent, right? So ideas like this. And also, of course, brand new ideas. How do we get those initiated? How do we get funding in order to become a true blue report and initiative? I was very impressed, by the way, uh, when you put forward, Paul, your measures of impact. You know, we, we kind of think about how do we measure our impact? And we have a thermometer, a little bit like yours, although it's not as quantitative, and think about how each report has impact, whether it really affect change, that is, improve health outcomes, and actually change the law, or actually change funding, or policy changes, and revision of the guidelines, to simply informing people about what's important. And this, this impact measurement becomes a dissemination strategy. So for everything we take on, we ask ourselves, who's the audience? And I'm actually undergoing, I've got a new communication director who's going to do a strategic plan to say, who are our audience? Because you can argue our audience are members only, you can argue our audience is the government. You can also argue the audience is the public. But taking on the public is not a trivial task, as you can imagine. When I went on my listening tour, people say, you should be the truth meter. We don't know who to believe in. Innovation, it, 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 um, vaccination, issues like that. So what we do is we have three tracks. One track would be track one, has great public interest. So we're going to focus on not only sponsors and stakeholders, but public. All, all, the extreme end of track three, which is only NIH is interested because they're asking what is going to happen in the future, chimpanzee research. And we're going to focus on finding, and of course, every dissemination requires money. So we're going to have to, very early when we do a report, be recognizing that we need funding. And so we begin the conversation. But very much like what Graham said, the government says, well, we don't know what you're going to report. We're going to give you money to disseminate things we don't want to hear. So we have to find ways by which we have flexible dollars to be able to invest in areas that we think are important. So I'm going to finish by saying, uh, what are we going to be doing and what are my thoughts? Well, the way I'm looking at it is that there are three things we must do at least for the next five years. Of course, advancing science and science-based advice. But here we should be willing to be ready effectively to respond to critical challenges. Not only asked by the government, but when, the, when you see it's an important issue that's of great public interest, we should take that on. How do we do that is the question. Second, of course, is where's health and healthcare going? That's truly important issue that we need to start tackling. And finally, is to lead and inspire for the future. Because too often, at least in our country, people are hunkered down. There's not enough science funding. We're too busy worrying about this. I think it's time to be an academy whose voice will inspire people to say, we can do this. We can go to the moon, right? If we only collectively work together. So I'm going to say just a few words about each one. So first one, last night, David pointed out this study. This was a study that nobody would touch because of Sarah Palin's death panel. Do you remember? It was going up there and then got died because you know, your grandmother's going to be, you know, they're going to remove care from your grandmother. And so no government will ever touch on 
end-of-life care. We have found a philanthropist who provide us not only with support for study, but the dissemination strategy. And many of you know about this report, which has been, I would say, if I were to measure impact, it's got one of the greatest impact. Why? Because first, we had a great dissemination strategy. We had a continuation of discussion with all our stakeholders, AMA, nursing, AAMC, you name it, and say, with this report, do you believe it or not? What are you going to do about this? So I had a summit in March where we brought together all the stakeholders. Each one wrote a statement of commitment of what they're going to do in this coming year, and I'm going to get them together again in March to see what advancement. But also importantly, we got together senators and House representatives on a panel discussion to discuss the implication of this report. Also, CMS which is your healthcare equivalent and others. And guess what? As you know, a month ago, CMS says they will reimburse for providers spending time in planning for end-of-life care. There are many different issues. We ask about integration between social and medical services, payment and services so that people don't have to go and go in a fragmented system. And I believe that certainly we go up to Congress and now they're looking at all these issues. GME. This is a report that was very controversial. If you're running a hospital like I did, you would never want to see this report because we said too much money is being put into the indirect medical education. Billions of dollars because it goes to a hospital, then get distributed to education. It should go to education. It should go to the ambulatory sites. And we propose, in fact, a $10 billion, actually 10% of this being removed billions of dollars, and over here to put it into education and innovation. And of course, you can imagine the medical, many of the hospital associates fighting this because you're going to kill the hospital. It's another really important report. Now Congress is looking at it, and they could enact changes that's good for education. Um, I want to end by giving a few examples of things we've taken on uh, since I've been at my job, things that we feel is so important that we're willing to take on risks. That is, we didn't get anybody to fund us, but we say it's important. And by initiating this, we have robust response and enormous impact, and not only receiving sponsorship, but also getting attention. And this one also speaks, speaks to a dissemination strategy. This is about, of course, Ebola and SARS, and as you mentioned much earlier, when Paul talked about what are you going to do with another pandemic or, or outbreak, epidemic outbreak? What is the world prepared for this? In a conversation I had with Jim Kim, the World Bank president, a good friend of mine, we talked about perhaps IOM or NAM should take this on because we need an independent, non-political recommendation, not from WHO or UN, but from someone from the outside. So this is how we got initiated with the help of Judith Roden from Rockefeller Foundation, the president. And then initially we got Margaret Chen, the secretary general of WHO, and we therefore developed this. And we developed this thing forward by saying we're going to look at how to advise the globe about preparedness. And look at this. I made calls to these, and they all came in to say, that's such an important project, we support it. Importantly, we create an international commission of 18 commissioners who are going to do independent report fed by four work streams. Should there be a change in the governance of global health, WHO, emergency responsiveness, you know, so on and so forth? Should there be, in fact, how do we mobilize dollars? And here, we, you know, as you know, the World Bank talk about an emergency facility or fund, but we now talk to the reinsurance agencies to see whether such a fund can be developed. How to strengthen work health system and create resilient health systems, surveillance, public health to healthcare delivery, and how do you actually incentivize the public sector, the private sector, in developing vaccines, and what's the best conduct of doing trials in the context of emergencies and, and, uh, and disasters. So this one actually is now being worked on, and we are now in the midst of um, the second and the third commission. All these workshops were carried, were finished. This was carried on London, 
Washington, Ghana, Accra, Ghana, and Hong Kong. All told, we have mobilized over 150 experts to put together a commission report, and the project cost three and a half million dollars, but we raised it. I say this to you because I think that if you had the right question, and I'll talk about partnership, I'll bet you the right question can drive a lot of support. And now, so the question for me is, so what if we have this report? Well, the good news, of course, is we get great support from Gates and others, but now, as been pointed out, in fact, by uh, Graham Bell, we're on the G7 agenda. Uh, we're working with Japan to be on the G7 agenda. We are in Merkel's agenda as well on this particular issue. And we are actually going to be working with UN High Commission. So that's dissemination. That means that you have to spend time figuring out who your contacts are, find the right people to be engaged, and begin to think about not only report, but who do we contact, who we can connect with to get this report to the right place. And with the right place, maybe policymakers may, may have the political will to make the changes necessary. Otherwise, it's nothing more than just a good idea. David Naylor kind of talked about that last night. Okay, human gene editing. This came in a very interesting time because what happened was our scientists got very nervous about human gene editing and came to Ralph Cicerone, the president of NAS, and to me, what do we do about this? And as you know, and, and I'm going to end very quickly, the Chinese already used CASPER, uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in human embryos. They argue that these are non-viable embryos, but you can imagine there's tremendous implication. So Ralph and I wrote this uh, editorial on responsive use of human gene editing technology, but to make a long story short, the two academies are taking on together on this whole issue of human gene editing, and we're going to create an international summit and a report study, and I appear before Congress with Jennifer Downer and others to discuss the implication of the ethical regulatory framework as well as many others. We obviously think this is a great technology that should be developed, but what kind of guidelines? So that's where we are, and David Baltimore is helping us to chair this advisory group to lead this, and I know we're engaging some Canadian scientists in this effort as well. And finally, um, I'm just going to skip through this to say that we are putting together questions about where to go, what questions are asked, particularly and ready for the next U.S. administration. Non-political, it's not about Obamacare, it's about what's missing and where we need to be in areas of mental health, et cetera, so we can inform the political debate as well as getting, as a transition team, to look at how they formulate the next health plan for the United States. And as I said, it is important for an academy to lead. After all, you're the best minds, and you should be bold enough to say, there are great ideas out there, how come we're not doing enough about this? And so inspire the, 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 the globe, inspire the public, and have audacious goals. And in that context, we are going to launch grand challenges. I know that Canada has a grand challenge, uh, you know, more driven by challenge, Canada challenge. This is going to be publicly engaged, like they did in Longitudinal Prize in UK with Royal Society. Get public opinion about what are the most important issues. Get private-public partnership, a little bit like Horizon 2020, and really, I'm going to skip through and try to tackle some of the most important issues that we all should be coming together, not separately, to uh, make different. We want to collaborate with you. I think, through, as the African proverb said, you want to go fast, go alone, you want to go far, go together. So I'm here to say we're very eager to work with you. As you, as you heard that we started our conversation some years ago, we should continue. We got a $20 million grant from Gates Foundation to help develop African Science Academy, which our academies are doing together. You can see there are many things that we've done. We worked with uh, uh, the UK Academy of Science and the MOU to work together in looking at some of the issues. Uh, we have the gene editing now, so co-sponsored by the Royal Society and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
We don't have enough work with you. I think there are some important work that we've done collaboratively with Canada, but not specifically with the Academy. We look forward to doing this. And of course, we're part of, the, in fact, the International Medical Panel. I think that's it. So, great opportunity. And I'm here as a friend of Canada, and as you know, I'm always grateful for Canada for giving me this, my start and my education, and uh, be really happy to spend a lot more time with you to find ways to move our agenda forward. Thank you very much.